Hey everyone, happy weekend. It is Friday, thank goodness, another long week behind us. Uh, welcome to EVH Care TV. We are live, and tonight I'm joined by a very, very special guest, uh, base legend Rudy Sarzo. Rudy, how are you? I'm doing great, Eric. How are you doing? Doing very good. It's a real pleasure to have you. I've been looking forward to having you on since uh, very briefly, two second passing in Nampton. I got to have Rudy on the show. So I know man, you're busy, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, I, I go there like for four days and it's, it's not enough. I know. You know, because I'm doing business and then I'm checking new stuff out, you know, meeting people and greeting people and doing shows at night. That takes up a lot of time, you know. It you does. know, doing the doing the after Nam performances in the evening, you know. So I get no sleep. This last one, it was rainy. Mm -hmm. If you remember, we had the like floods in in yes. L.A. So it was like, it was hellish, you know, getting in and out of of the convention center, you know. Yeah. My first Nam experience, my first California experience, and coming from Canada, I, I packed shorts to go swimming at the hotel. Couldn't even use it. <laughs> it was like, wow, what a letdown. But it was fun. It was fun. Did, yeah. Did you did you manage to stay healthy? Like you didn't catch any any uh, any Nam tracks? Uh, yeah, the the Nam crud. No, nope, I always get it. I I, I think it's uh, it's because I get no sleep because I always do you know the performances after the show and then you get in late and I need to get up early because I like to be awake by the time I enter Nam, you know, like right. around ten ten thirty in the morning, you know. So it's like you know I. I I'm I'm actually awake around six thirty seven o'clock, so I get like five hours of sleep. You know, you kind of run on fumes and anxiety and nerves and everything you do. else. Yeah, like I told you when yeah. I got back, I didn't even know what booths I saw until I watched videotape, and that's you know just too much for a first timer uh, to yeah. take in. But, yeah, but you know plus, what? Plus, plus you know people they recognize me and they want to you know say hello, yep. maybe sign something, and I'm usually on my way to another booth to do a signing. <laughs> you know, yep. so I just said please. Or, or if they can't make it, I just sign it there on the spot. But, you know, it's just, I'm always, like, dashing because I got, like, five-minute window to get from one side of the hall to the other side of the hall. Yeah. And that's not easy either. Sometimes when there's traffic in there. It's yeah, that's crazy. No, because, you know, you run into people and you can't be rude. Because being rude, even, even if you have a reason to be rude, there's never a reason. But just it's because you got to make it somewhere else so you're not late. You know, and you're not being rude to whatever whoever is waiting for you in line. Then you have to be rude to somebody else. No, you can't be rude to anybody. There's no there's no excuse. It's just that so one you person. have to stop, you know, and meet them and say hello and have that moment. You That's know? right. Well, you were very cordial to me, and I think you were running. You were going from one place to the next, but you stopped. You took a photo with me, and so thank you, for, and yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, it it goes pleasure. a long way. It goes a long way for sure. Let's jump right into it. One of the first questions I have for you is um, I, I look at you as like a chameleon in the business. You tend to mm. just you you just get into a project, and you fit. It's like you show up. You're there. You fit. You fit like a glove. Uh, you don't step on toes. You're just there. Tell me how over your career you've been able to do mm. that and almost overnight yeah. this fit. Yeah, to me, adaptation is the key. Well, it's one of the key fundamentals to the success of any musician. Adaptation and trust, just at the top of my head, trust, being trusted. Uh, but adaptation, and I, and I got used to adapting very early on. When I was growing up and playing the club circuit, we played top 40. Back in the day, Top 40 was anything from Johnny Cash to Paul Anka, you're having my baby, to Cool in the Gang, to Smoke on the Water, whatever. So you had to adapt. And that taught me a lot. It taught me a lot of, uh, because as you're doing a set, you can't approach Smoke on the Water just like you did Boy Named Sue. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? It, it has to be a whole different vibe and approach to it. So I, I start studying recordings and productions you know and and the greatest bass players in the world were my teacher even though they were not aware of it because i was listening i learned to transcribe back in the day where we dropped the needle on a record yes <laughs> and kept playing over and over again you know it's not like today you you know you either go to uh youtube and or you download it and you put it on your favorite transcribing application so you can loop it that's right you know? yeah i mean nowadays you you can even find uh soloed bass tracks of certain songs isolated yeah 
isolated. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, by back then, you know, we didn't have that. We just had a our ears, a record player and whatever music theory we happen to pick up on, you know, studying in school. Exactly. And here's something you'll appreciate, too, because, you know, from the day, learning things from records. Remember, we're going to talk a little bit about Van Halen tonight as well, too. But Van Halen, back in the day in the Backyard Party Band, were known for, like, incredible covers of some of the, the hardest tunes to play, like I'm Going Home and things like that. And, and guitar players would watch Eddie play these notes, and the band would know everything really good. And they'd get this one spot, and they'd talk to the guys after the band. They'd say, you guys did everything so good, but you, you did that one spot, and it didn't, it didn't make any sense. Little did they know that when the band was earning the record, there was a skip in the record, and they had to improvise for those four and a half or six seconds of the skip, and so they improvised it. So that was, that was kind of a neat little tidbit. That's very cool. Yeah. I mean, to me, it, 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 it all comes down to that. I mean, once you learn the song, and I got to tell you, there was a lot of improvisation going on when we played in bars because, you're, you know, back in Florida, where I grew up playing at uh, six sets a night, there were long sh- sets you know you start like around 11 because people they really didn't show up to the bar until like midnight or after midnight and then it's is like open until four or five o'clock in the morning so you did 45 minute on 15 off and by the last set you're just improvising you're just keeping yourself awake and amused <laughs> by by you know just not playing it just like the record putting in your own spin on it everybody in, in the band even if you want to if, even if you want to remain true to the record, the drummer might not be playing it the same way you know, or the guitar player, you know. So it was just a way to keep us amused. And what it did is it taught us how to break away from from what, you know, how to basically uh, reharmonize the song, you know, exactly. with different chord changes and, you know, different things or modulating in the middle of the song, you know, just doing things on the fly just to see if we could. And you know, by five o'clock, everybody is uh, is is a little happy. <laughs> That's right. So you can get away with a little bit more liberties then. <laughs> you know, it's, it's especially in the audience. You know, so they don't hear things exactly the same thing that they would hear it when they were completely sober. Yeah, you know? at ten o'clock at night yeah. or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, a little yeah. A little improvisation can go a long way after a couple of drinks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that can yeah. work both ways. You can work with the bands having a couple of drinks and the audience, and vice versa. Well, just just to give you a an example, uh, we found out very early on in our lounge band career, you know, club, mm-hmm. uh, Miami. Since since it's a vacation uh, destination, there's a lot of entertain entertainment clubs, dance clubs. Mm-hmm. Now there might be DJs, but back in the day, there was no DJs. It was live band, certainly, and and there were tons of those, especially in the on in the in Miami Beach, North Miami Beach, you know, where the, a lot of most of the tourists stayed, you know, uh, and it was closer. It was kind of like it began like around North Miami Beach and it went all the way through Hollywood, Florida, all the way to Fort Lauderdale. That was basically our circuit. So we found out that the club owners prefer bands that make people dance. People dance, they sweat, they buy drinks. That's right. You get hired back. Happy bar owner. So we figured, yeah, keep them coming. So the best way we found to keep people dancing, even though we were playing top 40 and rock, was to have a percussionist. We had a conga player. Nice. So, you know, there there were, uh, in those days, you know, right right around the time when Jimmy Miller took over production duties with the Rolling Stones, he brought in a lot of percussion into it. And then he added that with bands like... uh, traffic and so on so you know there were already and of course you got santana so already you have some some of that in you know in top 40 so all we did is we basically every single song that we performed we added percussion to it and so people were dancing constantly during the whole set so we got hired a lot you know so these are one of the things that you, you adapt you know you not only are you reharmonizing the songs, you know, to make it fit, uh, to give a little variation, but you also you're doing that with with, uh, with beats, you know, a feel of the yes, song. Yes. You make it more danceable, you know. A lot of times like, you'll uh, feel the melody before you you hear it. Oh yeah, For, I'll give you an example. We used to play because it was top forty. We used to play uh, 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 Pimple Wizard. Nice, Pimple Wizard, right? And at the end, we would do like a Santana 
soul sacrifice jam that will be like for like 10 minutes and it was mostly just percussion sure. and guitars vamping vamping and people loved it it wasn't it wasn't pinball wizard anymore it was el pinball that was gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd give, you know, give anything to have video cameras back then to see that. Oh, God. Thank, thank God there were none. It's probably eight millimeter back in that day, I know. Yeah, that, that's oh, no. that's awesome, though, for sure. <laughs> and that's the thing. You know, we, we talk about David Lee Roth a lot on the show. The, David Lee Roth has a lot to do with Van Halen's Club Day success because bringing danceable rhythms to that band. Had he not oh, yeah. joined the band, uh, you know, they'd be doing Sabbath and Rainbow and, uh, and you know, Deep Purple and uh you know you know some stuff that's danceable too like zz top and things like that but you know david lee roth brought that rhythm and that's why a lot of times they were hired back in a, in a second before they even finished oh yeah absolutely yeah absolutely and they used to play at, at gazari mm-hmm. i i i arrived in los angeles around 1975 and then i left and i came back permanently around 76 and i remember that the slogan for gazari's was if the guy, if the band is not Foxy, guys, they don't get to play at Gazari's, <laughs> you know. So obviously it helped that, you know, David Lee Roth and the uh, the rest of the guys, they were charismatic. You know, they were they were a good looking band, you know, and I, and I can definitely see David Lee Roth attracting a lot of the girls, you know, to come to the show. For sure. Because we. We did the same thing with Choir Riot. I mean, you know, Randy Rose, he had his fan club was mainly female that that came to watch the band and they, and and you knew it because they were all standing in front of him you know loving it so that's yeah that that's a question but, I was gonna, sorry go ahead yeah but los angeles was a totally different scene than miami mm-hmm. see people came to miami like myself i mean to los angeles like myself to get a record deal to become a recording band the the guys that stay behind in miami when i left they were it, they were just satisfied with being you know making a whole lot of money you know making really good money, and they were living in a vacation spot, and they were living it up. Every night was a party. But I wanted to be a recording artist. I wasn't. I just didn't want to be some, you know, Touring some out. guy that was going to devote his life to just playing other people's you know material and in 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 a, in a bar. Yep, do it no. for the rest of your life. You could get you could get stuck in that too. Well, yeah, that's it. that's the outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no. I mean, if you dedicate your life to doing that for whatever reason, uh, you're pretty much stuck. That's right. And but you know, so L.A. again, w- with a very few exceptions, you know, like Van Halen, that were homegrown, L.A. band, mm-hmm. uh, Quiet Riot, except for me, everybody was homegrown. You know. And uh, very few exceptions, you know, uh, most of the bands that, that guys that I've met in L.A., they were from out of town. And we just the only reason why to be go to L.A. was because that's that was it. That was that's where everything was happening. That was the Mecca. Mecca and beyond. Yeah. yeah. That, that was one of the questions. So it was more you, like Babylon. Yeah. You said you came around 75. I, I thought it was a little bit later, so that's a question, or actually a little earlier. So when you arrived, was Van Halen kind of the party band, the backyard the backyard party band at that time? Did you hear the buzz on the on the scene? I never got to see Van Halen play live. Uh, I got there, and I, I went to L.A. two times. First time... It was like around, yeah, 75. And then we were trying to put a band together with this guy. And then we went back to the Midwest because we couldn't find the right people. And he knew some local people out of Lincoln, Nebraska. So so I I got to Chicago. And when Cheap Trick just got signed. Mm -hmm. And... So, again, we were we uh, uh, we we worked a lot. We were playing just about every night, everywhere, but we couldn't break into the uh, the recording industry because it was very limited. You know, all the labels, all all the bands from Chicago that wanted to get somewhere, they were moving to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So we figured, you know what? Let's go. Let's do it. So that's when. 
again, I left, you know, where, you know, the Midwest and wound up in Los Angeles for a second time. That was the time when I, Van Halen was already signed mm -hmm. by then. This is like 76. So that was, that was, uh, yes, yeah. they, they had been signed at that point. And, but when, I lost a little bit of your audio there for a second. I, think, I got yes. you back. We're, we're back. There you go. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Yeah. Well, here's here's a question yeah. I had for you. I know you get asked to death about um, playing with Randy Rhodes. I'm going to put a little bit of a different spin on the Randy Rhodes. Um, Randy is, is a name that's mentioned on the show here a lot. And obviously, I mean, God God bless his soul, amazing guitar player. And who, who knows where he would be today if he was still with us. But instead of asking what it's like to play with Randy Rhodes, the question for you is, what is something you might have learned from Randy, either about music mm -hmm. or about life itself? You know, I wrote a book about it. Right on. It's 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 called Off the Rails. Familiar with the book? Familiar with the title? I haven't read the book yet. Yeah, it's all in there. Okay, all right. <laughs> Let's get the book. Let's get the book. I mean, because you know, it's it's a, that's the reason why I wrote it. I mean, it this it's 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 not a a nutshell kind of an answer. Mm -hmm. It's uh, because to me, I mean, there's so much that I can say and so much that I owe to Randy. Sure. Uh, that I just couldn't, you know, put it in a nutshell. But but I'll try just just for the sake of giving you something. So as far as musically, well, you know, Randy was was a music teacher. He he he, his, he's professionally he stopped teaching when he moved to England to work to work with you know to put the band together with Ozzy. But he was always a teacher to me. Personally, I, I saw that he never stopped teaching. He just stopped being a professional teacher and become a professional recording artist, musician, performer, so on. You know, the Randy Rose that everybody knows today. But back in the day when I was uh, a member of Quiet Riot with Randy, I was also teaching at Musonia. And he had about eight hours or 10 hours worth of students every single day. Wow. He would go straight for him teaching at Musonia, his mom's school straight to uh, to to rehearsal we will rehearse every single night and if you ever take a look at one of randy's photos on stage you notice that he's, he's the way he holds the guitar is like he's showing instructing the audience what he's playing mm -hmm. he's teaching as he's playing on stage you know he's never like turning the neck around or doing anything. It's very clear. There's a lot of clarity in his playing. You can actually, sometimes I can look at a photo and say, oh, he's playing this song. You can tell. Because I can tell. Uh, because he, you know, he'll, the, the way that, that he'll, where he's playing and also what guitar he was playing at the time because he would use certain guitars for certain songs, you know. And uh, so musically, he was very, very deep. What happened was that when we were together as Quiet Riot with Randy Rhodes, the last band, rock band, to get signed out of Los Angeles was Van Halen. After that, the doors were shot. New Wave and Punk came into the scene, mm -hmm. and bands like Devo and The Knack and The Motels and you know everybody, they were they they were getting signed. You know, we were. Randy must have been about 22 years old and, and Kevin about the same age. I, I was in, you know, early 20s. And we were told by the record labels that we were dinosaurs, that the music we were playing was never going to come back wow. to give it up. You know, not, you know, of course, um, if four years later MTV comes in and it just explodes, you mm -hmm. know, heavy metal and stuff like that, which quite the mental health quite arrived version of the band got to experience that but things were really bleak in 78 79 for any one of us and it's, it just wasn't quite right i mean we're looking at an early incarnation of motley crew called london mm -hmm. we're looking at dokken we're looking at greg white you know all all these bands rat known as mickey rat we were all like going you know like we're, we're, you know what is this punk thing we 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 didn't get it you know we were we were rock rockers. We were a rock band. Now I look back and I appreciate it. 
but back then it was like I I don't know. I didn't know how to how to be a, a punker or a new waiver, you know. That <laughs> wasn't that wasn't what 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 I what I'm about or was mm-hmm. about, you know. And uh, so when so when Randy left to join Ozzy, Ozzy gave him the freedom to break away from the pattern that we have developed in Quiet Riot, which was basically write demos of songs that we thought could get us on the top 40 charts. Songs that the labels were asking us, you know, they, they would come to us and say, ah, you know, like that song, uh, Do You Think I'm Sexy by Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we would go in and, you know, spend a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, whatever, working on the song, make a demo, come back to them a month later, and the guy goes, yeah, but that song is off the charts now. How about this other song? So we were chasing our tails around. You know, so by the time that, that Randy got together with Ozzy, Ozzy said, uh, uh, Randy asked him, what, what do you want? What, you know, what do you want me to, uh, to write? And Ozzy said, just be yourself. Nice. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. So now he's got the freedom to not have to deal with second guessing what a record label is going to like or, you know, or the direction of the band. It was only a matter of like start writing riffs. And, you know, some of the riffs were actually transplants from some of the stuff that he was working with in Quiet Riot oh, cool. that that he brought to Ozzy. And they were reworked and, you know, different feel, that maybe a different key. But that was kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like if you put a band together and you're going to start writing songs, you know, some guys go, what do you have? You, you know, you come up with stuff that maybe you played in other bands that never, you know, the song never got anywhere mm-hmm. or you got stuff that you've been working on. So you just bring everything and you say, well, I got this and I got that and I got the other thing. So certain things get put together and you go, oh, wow, OK, now we have a song. But then you can always hear a tinge of where the seed of that song came from, you know. So on the first record, Blizzard of Oz, I hear a lot of that. I mean, there's. This goodbye to romance mm-hmm. is very similar to what became known as Teenage Anthem, a song uh, that used to be called uh, uh, Teenage Anthem. Actually, got recorded as "Winners Take All." Okay. On the condition critical, but you know, there's 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 bootlegs all over YouTube of us playing that song live, and you go, "Oh, that's same song." That's uh, that's uh, goodbye to romance, you know. So that's – Randy on Blizzard of Oz was very uh, diatonic as far as his compositions go. I mean if you, if you break down Mr. Crowley, D minor, F major, and in the outro is every single mode in the key of F major, you know, going in, mm-hmm. in, in, in fifths, you know. And uh, uh, Goodbye to Romance in the key of D major is every single chord in the key of D major. Crazy train. A major, you know, with uh, <laughs> with you know the relative minor in the da 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 da, da, da and then it goes to A on, on the verses, you know. So that was his his writing style. But Diary and Blizzard were recorded within six months from each other. By the time he recorded uh, Diary of a Madman, he just broke away from that completely. You know, songs like Diary of a Madman and Tonight. It's a whole it's a whole different different theory music theory that he applied composition, you know, uh, technique that he applied to all those songs, you know, parallel minors and you know parallel modes is using you know going from mi- minor to major in the verses and stuff like that that were not present on the first record. So he had really been developing his writing style and you know, so God knows I. I you know, he was he was ready to go back to school at the end of Diary of a Madman tour. He just wanted to get his degree in music, uh, get check check out the uh, the the New York City uh, recording. You know, studio musician mm-hmm. scene. You know, he just he just wanted to be challenged. Uh, what happened was that Blizzard of Oz and Diary were recorded back to back. By the time that, uh, that Tommy Aldrich and I joined the band, we got together to tour for the Blizzard of Oz record, took a month off 
And right after that, the Diary of a Madman tour and record came out. Wow. So we were on the road. I mean, Randy was on the road with us even before I joined the band mm-hmm. because he, he and Lee Kerslake and, and Bob Daisley, along with Ozzy, they tour as Blizzard of Ozzy in the UK. So he needed a break. He really did. He needed, he needed to, like, to play something else because <laughs> he was just basically stuck on the same, you know, 15 whatever amount of songs that we were doing every night, you know. And remember, we were talking about the need to improvise. Yes. Well, it was limited, limited improvisation with Ozzy because you still, Randy's solos were very thematic. You know, there's a certain melody, so it's not like all of a sudden you can take Crazy Train. Yeah, you, he could play it different, but people don't want to hear a different solo. No, no, no. Of Crazy Train. You can hum the you know, solos. They wanna, yeah. They want to hear that solo. So a lot of his solos had those little things to them, you know. So jamming, and we and we never jammed on stage. You know, I mean, there might have been like Suicide Solution, but that's not really a jammy song. That's more like a like a vibe, mm-hmm. you know, just play it out and there's all this stuff going on. So it's not like a shredding, improvising song, you know. So, yeah. So the positives were that you had freedom to write uh, and Randy had the freedom to write, but once it's written, it was kind of scripted every night, kind of, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, he did. And and he, uh, he was getting really tired with that. Yeah. That's why, I mean, he wanted to... He, f- he figured that the easiest way for him to really get in away from from playing what he had re- uh, composed and record was to actually be a session musician on all the people's music. Wow. That, that was it was like it's easy. You just walk in, play something. I mean, he could read no problem. You know, he was studying uh, classical guitar, you know, and. I mean, he could read way before that. He grew up reading. You know, his his, his mom is a, is a music teacher, yes. and his brother, you know, he's a musician too. So, reading was one of the first things he learned as, as a child. And uh, so, for him to walk into a session in New York it would have been very, very easy. You know, just you walk in, get the sheet music, and play it. You know, uh, so he just he he wanted that. He just wanted to like a like a creative. Uh, colonic mm. <laughs> I guess. just purge everything and, and start fresh you know the chances are if he was still with us today you never know he could be on some of the greatest uh, recordings out there you never know oh yeah no i'm pretty sure that that was just going to be a phase a phase he just needed a break sure he he didn't have a break he didn't even get to enjoy whatever uh money he made you mm-hmm. know because working we were busy yeah we we're busy touring he he still lived with his mom by the time he died and still drove the same car that he had before he joined Ozzy. Wow. Yeah. I love it. Here's a really good comment yeah. over in the chat. Uh, this is from my uh, friend Adam Reaver. He says, uh, from fu-tone.com, he says, I first met uh, uh, Rudy via Eddie Van Halen. He says he was, uh, Adam works very closely with Eddie. Uh, he says, I was wrenching guitars in the dressing room for a PV demo at NAM. Rudy knocked for Ed. Uh, who was not there yet, uh, fashionably late, uh, like always. And he said, uh, so he, he sat and chatted with me for uh, about an hour or so. So very, very cool. Adam Reaver from fu com. just talking to him on the phone today. Uh, so he's a big fan of yours and uh, obviously a huge supporter of your longtime career. I love Adam. He's, uh, I, do, do your listeners know who Adam is? Oh, they I mean, do. I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, they do. great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember Adam when, when he was just a, you know, right now he is very established. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody in the music community knows his products and knows about him. But back in the day, he was just trying to break into it, and it was so great that uh, that uh, that Eddie embraced his his ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, and look at him now. You know, it's, it's I'm, I'm I'm very proud of his success. He's he's mentioned on the show as much as Eddie himself. He's uh, he's, he's <laughs> a, a huge part of the show. Love him to death. Yeah. Had a nice phone call with him today. Here's here's the thing I wrote down. This is really cool. I thought this was a really cool statement. I uh, I don't read bass magazine. I read guitar magazines because I'm a guitar player. But you know, every once in a while, I'll see somebody that's really cool in the cover, like yourself or Wolfgang Van Halen, some one of my you know f- uh, you know people that I love. It was the April issue of this year, and it, you were on the cover, and the headline was "Do What You Love." I I really love that. And when you got into your career, coming back from Miami to fly, you know Florida, Florida, and everything, then to LA, 
Um, did you ever think by this time in your life you'd be doing what you love for so long and having you know a lucrative career out of it? I got to tell you, I love what I do today more than ever. Uh, I don't know. I've just entered this phase of my career where, I mean, I am secure. Mm-hmm. Not even not as in every single way, you know, financially, mm-hmm. emotionally, most important. You know, the finance was, you know, takes care of itself. You know, it's a it's a reflection of your of your of your product. You know, if 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 you if you pay attention to what you're doing and you put love into it and and do something and you get together with with the right people, with the right music, it's all it comes down to the songs. Uh, then you'll be, you know, you're gonna be secure you know so that gives me more time more freedom to just play i play more today if i wasn't talking to you i would be playing right now i know i know you would you know and i play i gotta say i play most 90 percent of my wake hour you know of, of let's say if i if i'm awake for uh, 18 hours mm-hmm. I, I get very little sleep. I sleep about six six hours uh, a night. Uh, I would say that ninety percent of the time, if I have an instrument, if I can have a, put an instrument in my hand, ninety percent of that time that I can put an instrument in my hand, I'm playing. I'm either recording or I'm learning. And most of the time, I'm just I, I I balance it because if if I just if I just record. And I'm not learning. I ooh, I don't like that. It makes me nervous. It makes me ans- anxious. Yes. There's a and, qu- and and it, and it's a type of knowledge that I might not ever be able to apply in a working situation. But nevertheless, it's it gives me joy and pleasure to get myself to that level. So so again, you know, it, it might it. I, I love – I have more time now to love what I do than I've ever had, and I, and I do more of it than ever before. The funny thing is I was going to say – I'm cutting back a few questions tonight too just to keep our time slot. But one of the questions I had towards the end of the evening was do you ever see yourself retiring? And we won't really get into the retirement aspect, but I, was, and I made a funny, <laughs> I made a funny yeah. side note. I said I know for a fact just by studying you that I, what would you do when you, when you retired? And I, I said as a side note, you're probably going to play more bass than you play now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, well, I, if I would be retiring, I'd be retiring from music. And we'll be doing the same thing, except That's right. I wouldn't that be going on tour or yeah. you know or recording. So nah, no, I I made a uh, I made a I I, I I made a promise to God that as long as my fingers were gonna keep moving, I was gonna keep playing. Awesome. And uh, I gotta keep my promise. That's right. He's get, he gave yep. you the he gave you the talent, and you you kind of owe it to whatever powers there are uh, to to the, use that. The, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I, I know people do who are just so naturally talented. Mm-hmm. I'm, and I don't think I'm I don't believe I'm one of them. He gave me the opportunity to find to it. work hard, mm-hmm. to work hard, opportunity to work hard. Uh, I have to work hard on my talent and I love it. If a, because I know, especially younger musicians, that I look at them and I go, oh my God, you're so naturally talented at your age. I mean, at your age, I didn't even own an instrument yet and you and you can play all this stuff. And if it comes too easy, they just, they are a little bit aloof about it. Agreed. And you know what? The, the, a lot of people mistake that fact that they see these, these uh, virtuosos out there. Um, one of the other artists that you've worked with uh, through Whitesnake, Steve Vai, I watched an interview with him the other day and he was saying, talking about, you know, I, I had to work at guitar. Guitar did not come naturally to me. So, mm-hmm. you know, God mm-hmm. gave him a gift of, you know, um, you might have some musical DNA in your genes. Uh, you have mm-hmm. it. You just have to discover it. Now go work for mm-hmm. it. So I, I like that. I like that. And if anything comes really easy to you, it certainly isn't necessarily worth it in the long run. It's, it's too easy. Mm. What, what has come 
uh, easiest for me is the understanding of getting inside the song. Mm-hmm. Not just playing notes. Right. No, get inside it. Getting inside it, you know, living it, absorbing it. That might be more the biggest talent that I have. Okay. Being able to do that because when when I'm able to do that on stage as a performer, you know, for example, playing with Ronnie James Dio, Mm -hmm. he writes these amazing movie scripts his lyrics and to get lost in his music with ronnie singing oh my god that was like what was going through my mind as i'm playing those songs and i'm getting lost in the the music (laughs) it's just like a uh lord of the rings or something like that it, it was magnificent what was going on in here so that might be a, the talent that I have, everything else I have to work really hard at wow. <laughs> to achieve, you know. And it's all re- uh, repetition, repetition. I mean, I there's every single day I go to certain uh, music uh, tutorial websites, mm-hmm. you know. And can I mention one of them? Sure, please do. Okay, yeah, yeah. My my favorite to go to, and it's not necessarily for the bass. For the bass, I go to Scott Devine, okay. but I usually go more to music theory websites and, or people that teach many, you know, different aspects. You know, mm-hmm. they could be teaching guitar, but then they teach guitar or piano from a musical, you know, with theory behind it. And they explain everything. It's not like somebody's showing you, okay, play this lick. No, the reason why you're playing this lick in relationship to the other chords is because, uh, this. you know, and, you know, and then you go, oh, okay. You know, and uh, his name is Rick Beato. Okay. And re- uh, recently he did a, uh, a tutorial and he says, he talks about retaining information done through repetition. And I thought I was having problems because, you know, I'm getting older. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not, you know, the same kid. Rudy that was, you know, playing with Quiet Ryan and Randy Rose back at, back at the Starwood, you mm-hmm. know. I, you know, I'm in my 60s now. So I was thinking, wow, maybe it's, I'm not retaining information because I'm getting older. No, it just so happens that the best way to retain information is by repetition. Because a lot of times I would be at the airport, let's say. I'm waiting at the gate and I'm, I go to a tutorial. And I, and I absorb all of this, you know, reharmonization, whatever. Then... By the time that I grab my base at when I get to the hotel after the flight, I go like, "Oh, what, what, what was, <laughs> what was that tutorial about?" <laughs> yeah. So I gotta go back to it, and I just realized this. Be- I didn't retain it because I didn't have the instrument in my hand to apply the information to. So then I have a reference. Oh, okay. Then then you go in deeper. That's right. Because now you know I I just learned something and I go, "Oh, okay. Let me apply this to a song that I play." And then you got a reference, and that is the best way to learn through repetition. Keep doing it and actually applying it, not necessarily on stage, mm-hmm. you know. If you want to keep the job, that's right. But apply it, apply it in a situation that is it's, it's language. You know, you you learn certain words, and you might wait a whole lifetime to say one word to speak. Yeah. But it's in your vocabulary. Mm-hmm. You have to get but it. Out. It might not be suitable to the conversation. Yeah, it might somebody might say to you, "What did you just say to me?" But your first That's word right. you learned, you know, same thing yeah. with a musical note. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Mike yeah. Palermo's jumping in. My sponsor from Mike's Music Online. I want to say hi to him. He's a great, uh, great guitar builder and a music retailer up in Thorold, Ontario. A big fan of yours, lifetime fan of yours as well. Um, I want to ask you a question. Other than you know, when you talked about, you know, learning how to impress the bar owners and getting repeat business with the bands, what is something about the music business as a young kid getting into it with aspirations of greatness? You know, as you, you know, you're thinking you want to be a recording artist. What is something about the business you had to learn the hard way? Ooh, that is a really good question. Okay. What did I learn? I, you know, you never stop learning. Mm-hmm. You never, never really stop learning. Uh... Uh, you know, at, at every level, there's always going to be greed involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, just stay away from, from those people. Stay away from the people that 
that mistreat you and abuse you. You you don't need them. Move on. You know, you're for everything you lose, if you lose one of those people, you're gonna gain some gain something even bigger. Right. You know, just just move on. You learned your lesson and just don't carry that baggage. Right. Just carry the lesson. I learned from that. Move on. And and put your focus into the positive things and what you can do now that you have gotten away from these people. Now, you, you made a very good point a few minutes ago um, to, about adapting and things like that as well, too. But you also said the trust issue. Now, trust uh, issue. Yeah, so you earn people's trust. So the bar owners trust you, managers trust you, promoters trust you, Ozzy trusts you, Ronnie James Dio trusts you. How do you, as a musician, you know, wanting to please everybody, hopefully, um, how do you trust people? Like, uh, that's, I'm kind of uh, curious how you do it. How do you just put your trust in someone that you don't know? Okay. Uh, actually, how I got to join Ozzy was because Randy trusted me. Mm-hmm. And the reason why Randy trusted me is because he already knew me from playing with him in Quiet Riot and also spending hours, hours and hours at Musonia. That's how we really first start hanging out in, in, well, at the school. And so here they are in, Lo- in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, and they're looking for a bass player one of the qualifications, I think the, the most important qualifications, and of course you had to be able to play the songs, but the most important qualifications was they, that the bass player was not going to be uh, a bad influence on Ozzy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, how do we know these people that we've never met, if we were 10 days away from going on tour, how are we going to go that we bring this person in the bus? It's, it's everybody in one bus. Er, the early humble days of Ozzy on tour with Sharon and everybody. If we bring this guy on the bus, how come we, we know he's not going to be a bad influence on Ozzy, making him want to drink more or do drugs, or <laughs> this guy could just disappear. Yeah, yeah, This guy could be unreliable. He could be drunk on stage, you know, whatever. It's a lot of questions, especially – 70s 80s you know a lot of professional musicians that's that's how they that was their mo that's why they did rock stars you know and randy kept telling them listen i know i know rudy he's you know he, he's not a drinker he doesn't you know he's not a drug addict he's not gonna be a bad influence he, you know he's the perfect guy and he can play the songs of course mm-hmm. you know so that's how i got the gig they trusted randy randy trusted me ozzy and sharon trusted randy and, Circle and with time, yeah, with time, they got to, yeah, okay, this guy, you know, but, you know, they put me through a test when I first uh, joined the band on the very first day, yep. you know, and, and, and Randy warned me about it. He says, you know what? They're going to test you. And I understood they that so much was riding on that tour that they just couldn't have somebody who was just going to come in and just, you know be a flake or whatever, you know, be, be a detriment to it. So, and then again, through the years, through the years, I develop a trust. You know, people call me up. I make a commitment. I never left the tour for another situation. I've, I've done tours in my life where I was part of a band and financially responsible. And I knew, I knew that it was going to be a hardship. I knew that, it, that the tour was going to lose money, but boy, I'm part of the of the contracts that were signed, and I'm going to see through it because I've made a commitment to it. I've been there, you know. I've I've had like when when I was touring with Inve Malmsteen, uh, we did like a six week tour for his Attack record, and I got a call from uh, from Wendy Dio. Ronnie's uh, wife and manager asking me, you know, to come in and record on Master of the Moon and, you know, join the band. And I said, you know what? I love to do that. But I, I'm i here in the middle of a tour. I can't walk away from, from, from being big, you know. Uh, I would love to join the band once the tour is done if you guys are still interested in me joining the band. And so I did. And so I joined, I joined Ronnie, Ronnie's band. Uh, many, many situations like that. As a matter of fact, when I got the first call from, from Sharon to audition for Ozzy, 
I was playing in a band called Angel. Yes. You know, and, you know, I felt like I'm in a band. I Even though I was sleeping on the floor and I was waiting up a record deal, we had nothing. But, you know, I'm, I'm in a band. And, of course, you know, by the, sec- by the next day when Ozzy called me back, I already thought about it and said, you know what? I'm in a band, but I, can't, I, don't, have, I don't have money to eat. Yeah. And I'm sleeping on a floor on a sheet here. So, you know, but, but my, my instinct is always to remain true to whatever, co- you know, I am doing at, a, at the time, you know. And, and right now, I am the, uh, the, the, the new member the new bass player for the Guess Who exactly. Canadian band. Canadian band, my boys. Not too many of them left. Yeah. The original members, but Canadian, yeah. Uh, Gary Gary Peterson is the uh, the original drummer. He's the one left. Mm-hmm. Of course, Jim, bass player. Uh, the, yeah, bass player Jim Kale. He's uh, he passed the torch. I I to me on stage at the in Las Vegas earlier this year. Nice. So uh, yeah, I mean they they're all very much involved, especially Jim. Jim is very involved with the band still, you know. But uh, but I am officially the uh, the new member. So anytime I get asked to participate in other projects, I always make sure that there's no conflict. That everybody knows. Hey, listen, blessings. You know, I I might be doing this record as a project, but I am a member of the Guess Who, because you know it, there has to be a clarity about that. I like that, and it's kind of it's kind yeah. of uh, it's it, it's a piece for you as well. Yeah, for sure. We are at. Oh yes, yeah, so absolutely. We're yeah. about fifteen minutes yeah. left in the program. You, you know what? I, I've I've been meaning to to mention this. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Canadian artists, yep. I just uh, um, a, few, a couple of months ago, I I, I an album by the uh, a guitar player named Adrian Rosso. Okay. Do you know him? I do not. No, I wish I did. Oh yeah, he's he's from your neck of the woods, okay. uh, um, Toronto. Okay, it's very close to me. Area. Yep, two and a half hours away. Yeah, a, a fantastic uh, guitar player, uh, Vinny Apice, and I uh, record album. Okay, it's instrumental. Growing up, I was a big, big, huge fan of like Jeff Beck and and uh Mahavishnu Orchestra, you know, Aldi Miola, sure. that type of, you know, fusion rock. And that's the spirit of the record. It's pretty much like that. So I, w- I was very, very proud and pleased with the way it came out. Fantastic. I'll look, I'm going to look that up. I just wrote it down for sure, too. I want to look that up. Yeah, Adrian Rosso. Ross, Rosso. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, yeah. Mike's Music Online says, hello, uh, guys. Uh, Mr. Sojo, thank you for keeping Randy's memory alive. I have Off the Rails and your story is inspiration. And I, I, we don't have a lot of time for questions, unfortunately. We are cut about 30 minutes short tonight. But a question from Stan Adams says, Rudy, where do you see the music world headed? Oh, you know, I, I have that conversation with some of the greatest minds, mm-hmm. you know, managers and sure. re- executive artists. And the music or the business? Is, is, is it a music-centric or business-centric question? Probably business, because he says music world. So, yeah, probably business, I guess, in a way. Business, I, I think it's still going towards streaming. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that... I've been doing this long enough that I witnessed the birth of what is known today as the rock industry. Mm-hmm. I've witnessed the birth of everything changed with the Beatles. Yeah. Before that, it was it was like a s- solo artists. Like you have Elvis, you even had Chuck Berry, Little Richard. They had a band behind them, but they were solo artists. Certainly. Then the Beatles came. It's a band. It's a bunch of guys. Wow. And they were all loved. Yeah, and and they were all equally significant to the chemistry and success of the group you know so i saw that and then the business people outside of the creative you know the creating the music they had to invent invent the industry i've read books i've befriended some of these uh pioneers in the music industry as a matter of fact one of uh, uh currently our management team uh one one of our uh, managers, uh, Ron Stone, was a a pioneer. He brought 
you know, uh, Neil Young and and uh, uh, Joni Mitchell, and he managed uh, CrossFit Seals and Nash and Young, and before it, it, it was really an industry. It was based on trust. It was like, okay, I'm an artist, and this guy here, hey, you know, you you went to school, you you're a lawyer. How would how would you like to manage the band? You know, Wicked. somebody they they're hanging out in in, in a, a, at the Sunset Strip or whatever, and you know, you become friends, and somebody has to take care of the business based on the trust. I I trust this guy. I know this guy. You know, so it it keeps developing like that. Prior to that. Musicians really didn't make that much money. Right. Musicians really didn't sell that many records. Mm-hmm. Or though merchandise did not exist. Meet and greets did not exist. You know, playing a stadium like the Beatles did with Shea Stadium, you know, that did not exist. So I think we're going back to square one of how the music industry in general was actually meant to operate, you know. Simple, being a musician should always be a calling, a calling. I started playing back in late 60s, early 70s. Nobody sold millions of records. Even the Beatles didn't sell millions of records, right? By the time that I started recording, I recorded five albums for major labels in a row in the 80s that were that went multi-platinum. Wow. Five, five in a row with three different bands. I recorded Speak of the Devil uh, with Ozzy. I recorded Tribute with Ozzy. Mm-hmm. Metal Health, Quiet Riot, Condition Critical, Quiet Riot. Condition Critical was actually shipped platinum. And slip of the tongue with Y Snake in a less than a ten year span. You can't do that now. I know. You can't. Nobody can. Nobody can. You know. Uh, very few, maybe. But again, this is the, it's it's become a singles and a download. YouTube generation, Spotify streaming, all of that. The days of actually going into a record shop and buying a LP or a CD and having millions of people do that, that, don't, that yeah, it, that's, it's gone. doesn't exist. Yeah. Millions, millions. I'm talking about the impact. But then, again, the impact in the music industry paralleled the impact of MTV. We don't have MTV anymore. We have YouTube but not MTV. The difference between YouTube and MTV is that MTV, just like radio, was centralized. There was a playlist that was decided by a committee or one or two people. Mm -hmm. Whereas YouTube is like walking into Costco. Yeah, it's by all of us. (laughs) And trying to find something. Help me over here, please. You gotta go down the aisles. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Two last questions because we're going to wrap up in a second. And um, the, I, I'm going to throw them at you right now so you know in a row. I want to ask you about playing the Us Fest with Quiet Ride 83. I think you guys were on earlier in the day that day. Van Halen was on in the evening. Did you get a chance to um, bump into those guys at all throughout your travels? Yeah, I did. Day? Tell us a little I bit did. about that. We, yeah. We were the first band on, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Noonish. And so we didn't get the helicopter treatment. We were like, you know, low in the totem pole. So we had to be in a van yeah. transporting us from the hotel that everybody was staying in the same hotel, from the hotel to the site. So I ran 10, 10 30 in the morning. We run into the Van Halen boys coming in from the night before oh, partying. Geez. Oh no. Yeah. That that yes, yeah. so we did bump into each other, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think they were they were uh, they were in party mode for sure. That's that's for oh, sure. Yeah. Awesome. I was actually I posted one of your videos today actually with, um, from from the Oz Festival, so that was pretty cool. And the last thing, more importantly than anything, anything I've asked you this evening about music. I mean, obviously it's great to talk about music, but uh, I want to applaud you for your um, investment into animal rights and and dog rescues and everything of the nature. How did you get into that? Was it was it a loss to you somewhere down in your lifetime that you decided to get into it, or how have you discovered and embraced that? 
Well, you know, having having furry babies, you know, gives you a whole appreciation. Appreciation. I, I think the world would be a better place if if people actually had in their lives, you know, a unconditional love, which is what's it's natural. It comes natural to them, you know. Uh, if you know, unless you mistreat. But then again, if you mistreat a person, they're 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 not going to have a really good outcome in right. life, you know. So it's basically the same thing. But but if you treat them kindly, they'll treat they'll give you the most the the, the most incredible amount of unconditional love that you'll ever receive. Right back to you. you. Know? Are there any organizations yeah. you'd like to mention that uh, maybe you, you things that you're deeply invested in, or just anything you want to shout no, out? No, you know what? I am agnostic when it comes to any uh, organization. I think that they're all equally uh, wonderful and, 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 and they're so dedicated not only with their time but, but they're really passionate and I mean uh, well I would say Linda Blair's organization it's, it's it's one that I know personally okay and she, and you know she's given up her career years ago as an actress to devote her life to rescuing Wow. You know, I mean, she she'll go anywhere. She'll drive for hours to rescue a uh, a dog or a cat. That's she something will. else. It really is. You know, with no regrets. All, all all she needs is support. That's all she asks for people to be able to support her, because she's you know basically this is what she does. You know, she. That's her calling now. That's her. It's her calling, and it is a calling. Mm-hmm. It really, really is. I mean, compared to what I do, I mean, I. I, I might create awareness, but she does she does the dirty the dirty work. You're, she really does. I mean, she's the there. She's, she's, she's got a home changes. that is devoted as a sanctuary and as a shelter, and she goes around to local shelters pulling animals out that are on the youth list. And I mean, she's the real deal. So if if there is one organization that I would really recommend, it would be Linda Linda Blair's. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll remember that. It's easy to remember her name for sure. Very oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's really cool? But one thing I like to try to do in every episode, and sometimes it's harder than others, but I like to try to find a takeaway from the evening. So I think I think there's three takeaways from having you on this evening. First of all, thank you very much for your time. Number one is trying to, uh, you know, everyone try to support one of these organizations or rescue a pet, whether it be a cat or a dog or whatever, in, anywhere in between, and, you know, take care of that for sure. I like your point about your calling. We just talked about Linda Blair's calling was, uh, you know, to rescue animals and be an advocate that way. But you, you said earlier, being a musician is a calling. So I think that was a very, very cool takeaway from the evening. And I think we can end it on a humorous note. I've heard a lot of funny things in my life, a lot of crazy stories in my life. But I think that this is a takeaway. Someone being a, possibly a bad influence on Ozzy Osbourne. That's got to be the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. It could happen. Well, you know, or or kindred spirit. Yes, that, that's all it takes. You know, uh, going going back to the uh, to the uh, what was the second one you were talking about? Uh, oh, the being a musician or uh, being uh, you're calling as a musician. Being a calling, being calling, How, being. You know what? It's it's. I would not be concerned with the industry or where things are going, because if you're going to be a part of it. You're gonna be, you're gonna be the, the the pathway, so it's gonna be going your way. You're gonna be the you know part of the movement of the, or the future of the music industry. I never in my life, and I think this is what I was trying to say when I was giving you the explanation about going back to 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 square one as far as the music industry. All I all I ever wanted to do was to make a living. Make enough money so I could do what I'm doing now, which is playing mm-hmm. 99 or 90 percent of my of my time, waking time. The other, th- I, and, and a lot of the time, I'm I'm playing bass and playing with my little dog at the same time, so she doesn't get neglected. She will like lay on my shoulders as I'm playing the bass. You know, we have this this thing going on that that she loves to watch me play. You know, she's my biggest fan. You know, but but again, any any young musician out there or anybody who might be struggling with the industry, just love love what you do. Love love playing music. If 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 you need to make money to feed your family, well, you know, get 
some kind of a job that some would job. afford that. But I, but that doesn't mean that that's going to uh, uh, prohibit you from becoming a musician or continuing to be a musician. You know, music. I I wouldn't even see it as as an occupation. I see it as as the biggest joy and gift that, of any thing that you could do with your hands, mm -hmm. you know, or with your mind, with your soul, with your heart, everything. I love Besides it. playing with your puppy. Exactly. <laughs> and Willow. Willow is yours, correct? I'm sorry? Willow is yours. Willow. Baby Willow. Willow. We have, and I told you off the air about our mix, we have Halen and Trebles. We have a Halen after <laughs> Van Halen. That's, we even had a bird one time named Van. So at one time we had a Van Halen. So uh, God mm -hmm. rest her soul. But listen, thank you so very much. I, um, off the Rails, that's available pretty much everywhere, Amazons, everything like that. Yeah, it's uh, Kindle and print. Okay. Uh, Amazon is the best place. Uh, there's, there's a, if you want an autographed copy, there's a, uh, a site called Chromacast that I have some of my uh, personal products in there. And there is a bundle of a poster and a and the book autographed. Okay, that's, that's the good. only place. Yeah. Okay, I'm definitely looking that up because I'm going to buy one of those for the boy. I saw my boy in the chat earlier said he wants a copy, so we'll buy one and get you to sign it for us. That'll be great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Listen, Rudy, thank you so very much for your very busy and valuable time. Um, it was You're very kind to join us, and I wish you the very best on your recording projects that you're telling me about earlier, you're working on earlier tonight, and your touring, and just keep doing what you're doing, and you're an inspiration to all of us. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air in a moment. And I'll see you at NAMM, right? Are you coming very, to NAMM? It's a very good possibility. You just might okay. see you. Okay. All right. I'll see you so stick around for 10 okay. seconds. We're going to say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone, thanks so much for your time this evening. Have a fantastic weekend, and we will see you very, very soon. Turn to the little man. He's going to tell us what his name is, what he's playing, and we'll talk to you very soon. Cheers. <laughs>